Hello and welcome to the Flix Forum podcast, where each episode we go back and we look at a Netflix original in the order of release. Today we have Netflix 161st film from 2019. It's the comedy mystery Murder Mystery, directed by Kyle Newichek, stars Adam Sandler, Jennifer Aniston, and Luke Evans. I am Jesse and I am here with MJ. Hello, how are you? I'm good. I'm very good. Very excited to talk about this film with you. Um, as as you know, we've done plenty of Adam Sandler films before, and we know that he is a big presence on Netflix. So uh, I love getting stuck into these ones. And this is one that you had seen before from memory. It is, yeah. So what? A, in 160 odd films, I reckon out of the first 157 of them, I'd seen maybe one or two prior to <laughs> us doing them on the pod. Uh, got to a point where I stopped watching them when I knew we were going to record them. But um, yeah, I watched this one when it came out. Um, so yeah, a couple of years ago now. But um, seems like I wasn't the only one who watched it in the first couple of weeks as well. Yeah, that's. Uh, it looks um, like we might have some uh, good information when we get to that part in a sec. But I guess we should uh, give our fast flicks a go where we do a quick summary before we jump into a bit more detail. So what's your fast flicks for Murder Mystery? Murder Mystery is a middle-aged American couple go on a, a budget trip to Europe and accidentally find themselves as the prime suspects in a high-profile murder case. Exactly. It's the uh, same for me. It's a couple on their 15th anniversary um, become entangled in a crime. It's pretty like uh, you pitch someone that and you say, hey, this is a movie, by the way, it's starring Adam Sandler and Jennifer Aniston. You're like, yeah, I could see it. I could see that film. I could see how it's going to work. Yeah, exactly. So we, we're probably going to spoil this a bit. So if you haven't seen it, one of the, the few people that haven't, uh, give some pause, come back later on, because we're going to talk a bit about how this was put together and, and where it sort of uh, originated, I guess. So MJ, start us off. Yeah, well, I, to that point, I didn't realise that it was had been around for quite a while in, in pre-production and sort of figuring out where it was all going to land because the first sort of rumours around this this story it come in June 2012. So it's quite a long time ago. That was when it was reported that Charlize Theron had signed on to star in Murder Mystery. So this was a mystery comedy that was going to be directed by John Madden. Uh, it was written by James Vanderbilt. So that was already in the, in the ether. That was existing... Back in 2012, uh, sorry, 2012. So before that announcement, the project had been set up with Disney um, and then Kevin McDonald was going to direct the Disney version of the film. So this is all going on. No one probably knows anything about it at this point. April 2013, so that's nearly uh, just under a year after was when it was reported that Colin Firth, Adam Sandler and Emily Blunt had joined this cast, although... I'm not too sure whether these are just crazy rumours or not because representatives for Colin Firth and Emily Blunt have, had denied that they were actually on this film. Who knows? Lots of stuff sort of gets out in Hollywood, right? September that same year, it was reported that both Theron and Madden had left the project, that Anne Fletcher was now going to direct it and TWC was going to produce it. Um, Theron then switched to become an executive producer of the film and her studio, Denver and Delia Productions, was also listed as, as part of the, the whole production. So that's the end of 2013. Five years later, March 2018, was when it was first announced that Adam Sandler and Jennifer Aniston had signed a star on this film. Kyle Newichek was on to direct it. The script from, um, from James Vanderbilt hadn't changed. So it's the same script we're talking about seven years ago, six years ago. Uh, and then Netflix was also on board, and this was going to form part of Adam Sandler's distribution deal that he had with them. I think we know that he had the four movies initially that he signed on for, big success, so I think they signed him on for another four, um, yep. which I don't know if we've had them all yet. Do you know if we've uh, had them all it, yet? Um, the comedy special, the 100% That, that was in the first four, I think. That was in the first four, yeah. was it? Because we had Ridiculous Six, Do-Over, uh, Sandy Wexler. Sandy Wexler. And the comedy special. I think that was the first that's four. Yeah. And then this is, um, was that one with Chris Rock? The oh, week the of. week of. Yeah. The week of and this one form, I think, the next deal. Oh, Hubie Halloween will as well. Yeah. And then there's maybe even one more still to come from mm. that. Because I know like the, the Noah Bombach, My Wish Stories wasn't included. That was just a movie that Adam Sandler was in. It was in, yep. Ooh. Anyway. We digress. Um, so, 
So that's the, this, this script that was written a long time ago. Adam Sandler had been linked to it for a long time. Finally, he's on board with Jennifer Aniston. Netflix is on board. Kyle Newercheck from Workaholics is directing it. Um, and then principal photography began on June 14, 2018 in Montreal. Uh, in late July of that same year, they began filming in Italy. Um, and what I found very interesting, this film was released worldwide on June 14, 2019. So that is one year exactly to the day that principal photography forget began. Also, it is my birthday, so it's a very special day <laughs> in, in that sense as well. But that's pretty crazy. One year, the exact same day they released it. So now the fun stuff starts because a couple of days later, Netflix reported that 30.9 million households watched this film in the first 72 hours, and this gave it the biggest opening weekend for a film in Netflix's history. Uh, about a month later, they then reported that the film was viewed by 73 million household in its first four weeks of release. And that was based on a viewing metric of at least 70% of the film watched, which I think is a pretty generous metric, to be honest. Um, and that also made it Adam Sandler's most successful film on the streaming platform. The viewership numbers then got adjusted to 83 million accounts worldwide based on their new metric of at least two minutes of the film being watched which at the time made it the fifth most watched original film on Netflix. Now, I believe they're readjusting that metric again to decide what a watch counts as, but um, obviously nothing's been talked about with this film in terms of that. No, it's, um, you've done an excellent job of putting it all together because there's a lot there. It's got a, a bigger story than we've seen in quite a while. Yeah. So. Um, you know, we've, we've had a lot recently where it's been very hard to find bits and pieces. So uh, it's good to actually, you know, hear something that is actually in the in the making for quite a while and, um, you know, eventually finally got there, which is nice to see, I guess. Um, the only other things I'll add to that is that in October 2019, after the success, like you've mentioned, they, they announced a sequel was in development um, with Sandler and Aniston um, reprising their roles. And then in August 2021, so not too far ago from when we're recording, um, they hired a director, Jeremy Garlic, um, and he was going to rewrite the script with filming to take place in Paris and the Caribbean. So um, another Hello. exotic location uh, for, for this film, the sequel. Spitz is doing a world tour. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess the, the, the other thing, I don't mind checking out of the translations uh, across the world. So there's a couple of interesting ones. They, they obviously all sort of revolve around the murder mystery type of idea. So you've got Poland. It was called A Killer Cruise. Because if you've seen the oh, film, yeah. it's, um, it's on a cruise, so not bad. Um, in Russia, it was called Murder on a Yacht. So, again, it in involves where the murder occurs. Yeah. We've yeah. got right. Spain. It's called Criminals at Sea. Taiwan. <laughs> okay, well, that sounds like a different movie. <laughs> We're getting a bit further away. Taiwan, um, it's called Life Threatening. So, that was, <laughs> just, <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, it, my... there's, a, there's a bit of life being threatened in the film, so you can't argue with them. <laughs> in the United Arab Emirates, um, we're getting a little bit further and further away. This one was um, called Funeral on Vacation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, we didn't actually get to say a funeral, but... Um, no, we didn't. Then, no. The last two we've got. Hungary was called Cowardice is Murder, and in Croatia it was called Random Detectives. So that's uh, where we're at with our titles from around the world. Wow. That's some um, good ones in there. Normally yeah. they're like real similar iterations and there's one or two but they they all went a bit different with this yeah um tagline did you see the tagline for this one i just read it then accidentally but i've already forgotten oh. it so go again oh, good. so it's uh, two two sentences the first one is first class problems the second sentence is second class detectives so it ties uh, in it ties in bad. it ties in it's not bad because it ties in very well with um where this couple are in, and we'll probably talk about it a bit later, but where they are in life uh, in comparison to those that are surrounding them uh, during this crime. So not, not too bad. I think, yeah, I think that tagline fits. I think it fits the film, fits the tone. It's fun. It's cute. Mm. This, uh, this was nominated for seven awards altogether. It's um, only won one award. It was nominated for the favourite male and favourite movie female star at the People's Choice Award, as, as well as the comedy star at the People's Choice it won favorite comedy movie um, out of that. And it was also nominated at the Teen Choice Awards for Choice Summer Movie, Choice Summer Actor, and Choice Summer Actress, obviously, for Sandler and Anderson. They're popular people. I know that obviously the whole uncut gems thing with Adam Sandler, he never got nominated. Yeah. And everyone's kind of like, oh, well, he's sort of typecast. But people like him. People like Adam Sandler. And I, he might not get the critical acclaim. But uh, he gets bums on seats, which is almost the most important metric. 
And obviously, like you'd watch this when this came out as well, and that probably was a little bit of the Sandler effect. Um, oh goodness gracious, yeah. it was, yeah, yeah. So I, I know you'd watch this. I got, I hadn't seen it, and I got a percentage match, which I only get every now and then. Um, I got seventy nine percent percentage match on Netflix for this one. So not bad. They, they haven't quite gone with that eighty percent A. They've they've just gone on oh, maybe a B plus. <laughs> you're, just... you're a B plus Sandler <laughs> convert. Plus. Yeah, very uh, very good. Uh, what about the consensus for this? What are the critics and audiences saying? IMDb has it as a six out of ten, um, which is a good result for a movie like this of one hundred and fourteen thousand ratings. So. A large, large number of people have rated this on IMDb comparative to what we normally see. Um, Letterbox is 2.6 out of 5. Not as enamored by it, the, uh, the Letterboxd audience. Nearly 84,000 ratings on Letterboxd. Um, I did flick through a few reviews. A lot of negativity on Letterboxd. But, I mean, I can understand that the real sort of filmy audience not falling in love with this one. Yes, I think um, the, the critics didn't necessarily like it either on our Rotten Tomatoes platform where it sat at 45% on 69 reviews. So that sits at Rotten. The audience also on that lower end at 42% on over 1,000 on there. So I'm um, on that negative end for this one. Um, but I guess that can lead us to our early thoughts. What are your early thoughts for this one? Yeah, as you said, I've seen it before and you know I liked it enough both times. I'm a big Adam Sandler fan. I think I'm discovering this more and more as time goes on. I, I just genuinely find him funny, but I think there's also this comfort that he brings to roles that probably goes back to, to me growing up with his brand of humour. I'm just really going to dislike it. Um, but this movie was pretty fun. It doesn't take itself too seriously. It, it plays up on a genre that already has intrigue attached to it. And there's a couple of laughs along the way. Um, I feel like the Jennifer Aniston fit didn't really work for me, but I, I totally get it. And I know why they did it. And it's probably half the reason why it was successful in a sense as well. So yeah, that's kind of where yeah. I see it. I am. Um, yeah. I, I'm the same as you, the same sort of age. So, you know, we grew up on those happy Gilmore's and Billy Madison's and, and all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, I think this one was a bit slow to start off with. And I think the humor that I liked from Sandler was probably missing a bit from this one, um, which I was probably expecting a bit more of. And that's probably where I sort of maybe the opposite view because I thought Aniston was probably the best in this. I, I thought her role was yeah. great and, and she was the highlight for me in this. Um, yeah, so uh, interesting, interesting takes. Um, and, and that leads us into the characters for this end. I um, I haven't struggled this hard with characters for a long time because <laughs> I don't, there's not a lot of context behind the characters. It's more about the situations and the, the actions, I guess, but you, you go for it because you, you do a good job with the characters. No, I'm so glad you said that because I was thinking the exact same thing. This isn't a movie where they have gone so deep on these characters that you can just keep picking them apart, picking them apart. Because I similarly, like, there's not much to say about them as apart from the fact that they exist in this situation. Um, yeah. We'll start with Nick Spitz, obviously, played by Adam Sandler. Uh, he's very set in his ways. He, he, he tends to... And again, I'm not even that confident with all this stuff because we just don't have enough on him. But he, he seems like he likes to be in control. But he also, you know, they, they very clearly set him up as someone who would be a decent detective, but he always, you know, freezes up when he gets to the exam. And he seems to think that there's this certain life that's set for him and he's in no real hurry to upset, upset that status quo and, and dream for more. Like he's very much just like, no, nah, I'm, I'm a middle-class guy. I get middle-class things. I'm not going to go on a big too hard trip to Europe because it's just, that's just not that's not for me even though you know there's no reason why it can't be but I mean he's really good in a pinch I think he, he thinks pretty quickly on his feet um, even though in this movie you get the sense he never really gets out of first gear almost <laughs> the entire movie not, I'm not saying Adam Sandler I'm saying Nick he's like he just kind of goes along with it even though he's you know up against things where his life's threatened so yeah that's that's kind of my take on Nick yeah there's not a lot extra to put in there, I guess, the, the idea of that um, failing, I guess, in bringing that romance to the relationship sort of uh, highlights that tiredness that I guess they try to to push on his character early on with, you know, I'm you know going to sleep on the plane. I'm going to hurry up and go to the hotel room so I can sleep. Um, and I guess that, that if you're creating him as a bit of a liar in uh, some of the stuff that he's pushing to his wife about his career, I guess that those things sort of match up pretty well, um, you know, especially with, when he's a cop and, you know, the, the stereotype and a lot of, there are a lot of stereotypes in this obviously. And you, you have that idea at, at times in comedies that 
cops are, you know, lazy or sit at the shop eating donuts sort of thing like that chief wiggum um type of oh, cop that you see you know that <laughs> uh but you know like a very pedestrian sort of character there's nothing nothing too much to call home about pedestrian is a good call yeah. um and look and it, the opposite of that is is audrey in a sense uh like she's she's just a little bit more of a dreamer more of an adventurer but you get the vibe she often folds down to, to nick's limitations and it's probably her excitable energy that well, it is that gets them on this trip in the first place. Um, I'll be honest, I actually think I related a little bit to Nick's, um, you know, in control, organized planning this trip mindset. You know, I don't want to get too much too far out of my comfort zone. I, I think I related to that quite a bit. And, and that's where Audrey challenging him on that annoyed me a little bit. I think I'm also, I, I may, I think I'm just a little bit over Jennifer Aniston. Mm. I, I, I think. Seeing her as like a bit of a wet blanket wife, kind of was just like, yeah, cool. I've, I've seen Jennifer Anderson do this. I, I, I don't love it, but you keep doing it. Um, and I think I never really connected with her. She, she sort of also goes from this damsel in distress to problem solver to being independent really quickly. Like there's times where she's just like an absolute ditz. Um, no idea what's going on. I need help. Just sometimes that she's like really firm, really strong. And it just, that, I think that kind of switch really got me as well. My reasons for not liking Jennifer Anderson, nothing to do with her performance. It, I think it's just a personal thing. It was, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. I, I, I thought um, the idea of her being a hairdresser and um, this love of mystery novels sort of created that idea that her view of the world or the her actions in the world aren't necessarily going to be the, the, the action that you see from Nick and I sort of didn't mind her sort of being all over the shop and being so focused on something that Nick's supposed to be good at in his life that she's trying to prove, Hey, you know, just, you know, I, I can still be successful in life as well at different things and have different passions and still, you know, love him for who he is, even if he's not successful. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really dug her performance. Um, and I know that you didn't critique her performance, but I, I feel like, she was cast really well, especially with the type of character that Sandler had. Um, I think if Sandler had been a bit more over the top uh, with a, some of that mm. slapstick humor that he uses, it probably wouldn't have tied in as well. Um, and she would have been pushed even further offside, I reckon. But I don't know. I just feel like from that performance from Sandler, she sat okay for me. Yeah, I think you're right. Everything you said, right. And I'm probably, just, there's just something that didn't fit right for me. And that's just a very personal thing. And I, I like Jennifer Aniston generally. Like I, I thought she was great in Where the Millers. Um, obviously big fan of Friends. She's she's very much done the same kind of rom com type roles for a very long time. But I generally like her, but it just didn't work for me here. Yeah, but that's that, can, that can happen at times when um, you yeah. know, you're so used to seeing a, a, a performer do that same role over and over again. I think we've had that lots of times before. So yeah, it makes sense. But, I mean, you could say the same thing about Adam Sandler in half of his movies. He's just playing Adam Sandler, but I like that. So it's it's, it's an unfair <laughs> personal bias that he just – everyone has what you take into every viewing. Like, it's the same with your environment. It's the same with your mood and your mindset. Everything everything goes to it. I might watch it again tomorrow and love her. So um, I'm going to be honest with you. This, this movie is full of characters, right? The only other one I really want to talk about is Charles Cavendish because I just – I could barely – think of enough reason and i know you've already done your spoiler alert but when you talk about the the killers in this i don't know i don't know anything about them like <laughs> they're, they're just kind of bit characters but um charles cavendish played by luke evans this seems to be an unpopular opinion because i was i was having a look online and he got absolutely smashed for this and i think it's more the role rather than the actual his performance in it like why the hell's luke evans doing this um I was kind of all in for this character. Uh, maybe the fact that my initial instincts of him being a good dude from the start, I always thought of him as like an ally to, to Nick and Andre. Um, and the fact that that was held true um, probably helped the fact that, yeah, no, I'm on board with this guy and I liked him and I was right about him. He just seems so in control. He seems so happy to embrace the drama. And let's be honest, he kind of gave our two characters this exciting story and exciting vacation. So I just, I liked him. I could. Yeah, I um I feel like it was the trying to mislead the audience straight away by, you know, why would some rich dude who's being a little bit flirtatious with, with Nick's wife and sort of puts you offside a little bit with him and they try to lead it down the, the path. Like, you know, why would he bring these two people along? Um, so I don't think as a, as an audience member, if you've seen these types of films before, you don't think that 
he's anything, um, you know, you, you know, he's not going to be the <laughs> the bad guy. Um, so, obvious, yeah. yeah, so maybe and I just didn't like the flirtatious side of him either. I just, <laughs> it's a little bit over the top. If um if Nick had have gone straight into first class and had a chat with him, do you reckon they would have been invited? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. I'm, I'm, I'm a Cavendish fan. Good. I, um, I'm, just, I'm very, it's the same as you. There's no one else really. I just wanted to put Toby in the, um, the cousin uh, because I just, I just love David Williams. Anything that he's in, I think he's, he's great. So it was just nice to see him on the screen because he's amazing. And his short, um, they're not short, but his uh, children's novels are, are hilarious and amazing. Um, so if you've got, you know, teenage, well, not quite teenage kids, but preteen kids um, that need something engaging to read, I highly recommend those novels. Um, yeah, he's, uh, did you did you expect to see him killed off so early? No, I didn't. Um, yeah. No, but I, yeah, no, I was, um, I just, yeah, I just like, like seeing him. <laughs> it's funny. Um, I, I, I saw this movie two years ago and I couldn't tell you what happened. And I was watching it again and I'm like, uh, not really even ringing a bell. Like, I, I did not know who the killer was. And again, we've done a spoiler alert. I didn't know who the killer was until it was revealed. And I was like, oh, yeah, that kind of rings a bell. And then I 100% didn't realize that there was like an accomplice the whole time. Oh, but that, like none of it stuck with me. And similarly with David Williams, I was like, ah, oh, I remember him being in this film. That's great. Yeah, he's great. And then he died. I'm like, oh, that's probably why I don't yeah. remember him being in it. And this isn't a bad reason that I forgot it. Like this is not the kind of film that's supposed to stay with you. Now that I've seen it twice, it'll probably stick a bit more of it. Um, I probably made the second viewing better than it could have been. But I, I was just like, I was watching it again for the first time. That's 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 a good thing, but uh, not necessarily a good thing that you didn't remember much about it. Um, yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's um, talk about the director, and I'm just going to put out here, Kyle Newacek. I knew I, as soon as I last week when I read out the that he was directing this film, I knew straight away that he directed Game Over Man, which we we covered on this show quite a while ago, and um, didn't I, I, I didn't hold a grudge against him for that because I, I really did dislike that, so I was just. We didn't agree fresh. on that film, that's for sure, yeah. No, not at all. So, um, yeah, that was – and we've obviously spoken about him previously. Is there anything else you wanted to add? No, no, yeah, same old – I think, yeah, so I think his main thing is he's the, one of the main directors of, or creators of Workaholics, which is the dudes who did Game Over, man. So, um, yep. yeah. That's, Good. All right. That's, that's scene that. time. Fill us in with some scenes that you enjoyed in this, and I reckon we might cross over on a few possibly because um, I'm guessing we're picking the funny bits out of this. Yeah, I mean, I, I started by, like, I wanted to write down all the funny things. And there actually wasn't as many, like, actual, like, I need to call out this scene. A lot of, like, little, like, huh, like you know, just the way, like, the inflection on the way they talk or little gags here and there. But the probably the one one liner that really that really made me laugh was early on when, um, you know, they were deciding whether they wanted to go with Cavendish or not. And he's like, oh, we've sort of already got this this whole trip planned about, you know, the, the ham aging thing and, when he said, come on, all those times we're eating ham sandwiches and you always ask how they age the ham. <laughs> that was so good. That is so the sort of thing that I would say to my wife if I was <laughs> trying to convince her to do something. And I think they follow on with it later on when they run into the bus. He's like, we've got to ask them how they age the ham. We've got to ask the people on the tour how they actually age the ham. So I thought that was very funny. Um, and you know what? If it wasn't in the hands of Adam Sandler, maybe I wouldn't find it funny. But I'm biased in that sense. So. Yeah. Um, I thought the murder scene, albeit predictable, it, it set up an exciting story. It was it was very big. It was very grand. It was very fun. And they just they just went all in on it. Um, you know, lights go off, lights go on. There's a dead body. Like it's it's nothing new, but it showed they were leaning into it with with the tone of the film still remaining. And I I kind of like that. I think it set it up nicely. I um I really enjoyed the like the follow on from that scene where the lights come on and the daggers in the body and you know, they're, they're like don't pull it out don't pull it out and the colonel like pulls it out puts it back in I thought I thought that was hilarious so yeah and he was just always like well we could start by a stop just like repeatedly taking the knife in and out <laughs> that was great I don't know why I laughed at this line. And I do know why, because it's funny, but I don't know why I'm pulling it out because it's not that it's not like a big line. But right at the end when Nick and Audrey are kind of explaining what they think's happened in the murder and the four people are all sitting in the seats and they're talking about it. I can't even remember what the reference was, but someone said something about Lady Gaga and Juan Carlos was just like, Lady Gaga, yes, paparazzi, very good. <laughs> I just <laughs> just thought it was really funny. I actually thought that some of his little things from time to time were very good. The whole no English thing was, was done pretty well. Um, 
Actually, on, and on that, I thought that his his twist was was pretty good for a movie like this. This movie could have very easily ended where it ended, um, and they added that extra layer by having the accomplice and tying it all back to how he fit in to the whole story. I actually thought when you're trying to make a murder mystery movie that that actually was better than I was expecting for it. Um, good. Another reference that I did like every single time Nick said. I'm hungry as shit or I'm tired as shit. I just thought that was funny. I just kept going on with it. Just the fact that he just always wanted to eat. He always wanted to sleep. <laughs> like he's on vacation. That's the stuff that I want to do as well. <laughs> so I get it. Good. Um, and then finally, the uh, the Orient Express at the end was just a nice touch. You know, the idea that they they finally get their vacation and um, they go on the Orient Express, obviously a very famous novel and movie and another murder mystery. Yep. I um I had that as well at the um as my one of my last ones too just that final shot but I guess the Christie sort of connection is very nice so um mm. yeah that was good too I'll um keep uh going on with a couple of more ones that I thought were quite quite funny um I back on the plane at the start I just thought when Audrey sort of takes Nick into the toilets to have a chat and he just starts taking his pants <laughs> off because he thinks he's getting laid that's, that was hilarious <laughs> that was very very funny um <laughs> and it took like half through the conversation it's like hang on. So we're actually not doing this. <laughs> yeah. it's just That was very good. Um, the same with uh, Nick and Audrey when they're in one of the hotel rooms and they get the the note saying, come to this other room. And he goes and picks up the lamp for protection. And I just thought it was just hilarious. But then the follow-up when they're in the cupboard and she's like, did you bring the lamp with you? <laughs> that, was, uh, that was good too. Um, I thought all the Colonel um, losing his dick jokes, I thought that was good. Um, <laughs> I, I um, also enjoy like there's a scene where Nick and Audrey are in the bar and there's like the news report on the TV in French and they're getting their waiter to translate for them and you know the waiter's doing his literal you know he's saying that you lie about being a detective and you failed many times <laughs> just for that to be the reveal <laughs> of, of Audrey finding out that he hasn't done it he's so explicit great. about what this yes. <laughs> that's very true um Audrey goes into the library at some stage and then oh, this is where her and Nick are sort of uh, apart for a little bit and then it turns out that Nick's the one following her and she sort of turns around and just whacks him. Um, <laughs> nice slapstick humour moment for me. Yeah, I'm nearly done. So the mass, there's this masked villain's part in the alley and <laughs> Nick's shooting him and like obviously missing because he's so crap at his job and Audrey's like, you know, actually shoot at him. <laughs> so I thought that was good. Um, and the last, last couple of things up. Um, <laughs> the whole setup like walking to Charles at the end and like making a big scene about well we've got you blah 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 and then just that shot of him yeah. frothing in the mouth <laughs> I thought that was great as well um, and the, the, the Juan Carlos's um, demise from the tour bus that was just I love that too <laughs> <laughs> you like that did you that I did classic. that was great yeah that's a good one um, alright what, what are some things that you didn't like in this I enjoyed how much you laughed in this film. I, I, that was that, this would have been a good movie to watch together. Yeah, it definitely. Would. Um, what didn't I like? I didn't like when they were first getting questioned by the detective, and Audrey's all kind of happy and excited by it all. It was just a little bit too much, and it was a little bit too far, and a little bit too obvious. Like I knew, I, we know that's the gag that they're going for. You know, these people have no idea that they're a suspect, so they're sort of downplaying it. But it was just a bit too much for me. I didn't. Didn't really lean into it as much as they might have. Um, and the only other thing I didn't really like, and this is really picky, is the high-speed chase kind of just did nothing for me. I think it was maybe a little bit longer than it had to be when we sort of already half concluded it. Sort of, yeah, didn't do much for me. I got that in that. That whole car chase was just an excuse again for Sandler to get in a nice car and, you know, make a bit of a joke about the driver's seat being on the wrong side of the car. That's what it was. Yeah. It was just. Um, that was actually. That, I, I think I chuckled at that when he got in. Yeah. He was on the wrong side. He's like, "What?" I was like, "Ah, oh, that's yeah. Of course you would do that." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I yeah, agree. Really it was way too long and not needed, really. Um, for me, like the a couple of the, the characters are stereotypes. Like the Maharaja <laughs> dude. Uh, I, just, I thought that he's he wasn't the same sort of. You know, I, don't, I just felt he was too up and down with his um type of personality and especially that scene with him in going to bed with um grace ballard mm. i thought it was poorly done um didn't didn't rate it uh the same the same with another stereotype the french french cops like you know very pink panther and spectacle so sort of vibe that you know it's just a stereotype that you see over and over again i don't know if we needed it as as much in your mm. face like that um 
and then I know that you didn't mind this, but I thought the whole Juan Carlos, um, you know, <laughs> un actually understanding English, I, uh, I just thought it was a lame way to finish it off. Um, yeah. <laughs> No, it was, I, I just liked his little uh, his little no English sort of things. We actually thought that were pretty funny. Yeah. Yes, good. Uh, we'll, Car, go very fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of well, stuff was good. What are some themes or some ideas in this one? Uh, again, like, kind of got two two parts to this. One of these, one of it is the whole um, the suspects and and why they're doing what they're doing, and it's the idea of jealousy and greed and the entitlement that they think that they've got. To, to this man's wealth. Um, again, not overly explored, but again, the whole film is based on someone killing people because they want to get the, for, the fortune. Um, and then from a husband and wife perspective or relationship perspective, they definitely do focus on the ideas of honesty and trust and teamwork. And when they finally get those three right, bang, they kind of solve, solve the movie really. Got the two exact same things you've said, just in different words. That you know, the idea of making a name for yourself on your own without needing the riches and the wealth of others, and the same with the the couples doing stuff together and being truthful, working it out, and coming to a conclusion. So on the same page. Yeah, I don't think we missed any sort of hidden themes that were <laughs> really pulsating under the surface. If anyone thinks we have, let us know. Um, <laughs> yeah, <please. laughs> what did you take away from this one? Well, I just want to say Knives Out came later on in the same year. I'm just saying there's a bit of similarities there. Do you think do you think someone's watching this and going, oh, hang on, I think we might I'm being facetious because obviously Knives Out would have probably been filmed and done and ready by the time this movie came out. But interesting that too, I mean, they're obviously very different films, but they're very similar premise in a sense that it's a, it's a high-profile group of... Um, in one sense, family, but almost like this is almost like a family unit as well. The old guy with all the money gets gets murdered. There's issues with who's going to get the fortune because of the will. Um, and and whilst the tone of this is definitely much more of a slapstick comedy, you know, th there's a lot of fun tones in Knives Out. I thought Knives Out was one of the best movies of 2019. No, there was an excellent movie and I'm hanging out for the sequel. But yeah, just very interesting that these two films... Because, I mean, the murder mystery genre has been done for so long. But that lightheartedness and that fun tone to it is is, is a little bit newer um, in that sense. So True. Yeah. And I think... With I all that said... Sorry, you all go. Around, sorry, yeah. I was just going to say, all around the same time, like, because um, there's the Kenneth Branagh ones as well that um, he's been yeah. doing that series of the Agatha Christie things as well. So maybe it's going through a little bit of a revival. Um, but yeah, I agree. I think Knives Out is, is excellent. And um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting to sort of think that these sort of came out at the same time with um, it, similar premises and, and similar attempts at adding humor to a murder mystery rather than it being very serious. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I also think this, this movie just really fits into that Sandler Netflix brand. It's a very easy conversion on the couch, very comfortable. I think it's obviously more in the realms of the do over and, and Hubie Halloween rather than like a Sandy, Sandy Wexler or Ridiculous Six, which are just different. They're, they're kind of different ideas of what you want to sit down and watch, but it just fits. It just works. I Like this Adam Sandler partnership with Netflix is just such a such a great fit. Mm, good, yeah. The other things I'd sort of take out, you know, this is just another, another opportunity for Sandler and his friends to go on an exotic trip, you know, again, get, get paid to go and, and see the world, which is um, pretty good. Um, pretty good, but he didn't bring that, as many friends along on this one. But he still, I think, his wife and his kids were still cameos. In the <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> his family. I, I don't think I've seen that Adam Sandler movie in the last ten years. It hasn't had his wife. In it. Yeah. Um, the other, the other thing that I thought was interesting is too, like in the opening scenes, uh, in preparation for the anniversary, Nick sort of goes into a store and purchases an Amazon gift voucher, and I was really surprised that Netflix would allow for such a, a high product placement of a competitor. I didn't even think of that. Look, I was shocked. I was like, oh, surely it's going to be like a Netflix gift card or something. But no, I was like, I was very shocked that they let that fly. That's a very good point. Obviously, Amazon is more than just their streaming service, but they're, they're a key competitor. That's a really good point. Hmm. Did you go into IMDb to check anyone out at all? I went on for um for the... So Jim uh, Arterton, who played Grace Ballard, I looked at her, I'm like, oh, yeah, I know you, you're so familiar. But all I've really seen her in is Quantum of Solace. And I don't think 
she was I don't remember her from Quantum of Souls. I don't know how main she was in that. So I don't know. There's just something about her that I just assumed I'd seen her, but I don't think I have. Good. Um, yeah, I didn't I didn't go on. I just there was no one that I really recognized. So yeah. Um question time. Do you have any questions that you wanted to ask? Well, I want to ask, did you did you pick the killer? Uh did I pick the killer? No. I I I I thought there was gonna be some I didn't even know if it was going to be any of those people there. I thought, you know, a Sandler movie, they might just drop someone random in that's like, oh, hey, I'm the yeah. killer sort of thing. So, no, yeah. I didn't. Kevin James, she would have been yeah. perfect for that. Or Rob Schneider, rock up going, <laughs> oh, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a great ending. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, you didn't pick it? I didn't pick it. it. Even the second time I didn't <laughs> pick it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, who did this? God damn it. <laughs> um, I, I like what's your favorite type of Sandler like in like that serious role like in just a, a drama like a parody type or like a comedy type role it's a tough one it's a great question but I also think and this sounds silly but this it highlights the versatility of him and I'm not talking about you know Daniel Day Lewis method acting versatility I'm talking about you know he's he's got some versatility and it's not a huge range but it's still a range um yeah I mean I think I think I prefer this kind of Sandler than a um, Shuby Halloween or or Little Nicky or that kind of Sandler where he's really, really going Over for top, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. I also like Sirius. Like, I thought Adam Sandler was so good in, in the My Witch stories. And obviously, you know, Uncut Gems was an Adam Sandler I'd never seen either. So I True. just like the guy. Yeah, he's, he's great. And I've, I've mentioned at some stage that that stand-up on Netflix is great mm-hmm. as well, just seeing him It is stage, really good, Because yeah. that's a different type of performance again too. So um, worth checking out. Well, I think that's almost uh, time to put it all together and give it a rating out of five. So uh, tell us what you're, you're thinking for your final thoughts. Yeah, I mean, this this is comfort watching with, uh, with my main man running point. So if you get yourself in the right mindset, you, you lean in to what this movie is, you at least won't have a bad time. And if you're a Sandman like me, then you'll be treated with a couple of laughs along the journey. And it's just an easy three stars to me. Nice. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, like the stereotypes in this, they're just like so familiar. And we mentioned it before. I reckon if Knives Out hadn't have, if I hadn't seen Knives Out before this and it hadn't felt like such a familiar sort of time frame and so recent, this probably would have felt a lot fresher because I would have been like, mm. I haven't seen something that does it along these lines as like this, I guess. But, you know, like I said, my scenes, there's, there's some good comedic moments, um, but just not the usual laugh out loud moments from Sandler. A lot of those were situations around other characters and things like that. So uh, two and a half. So two and a half um, gives us a 2.75. Out of five. It fits in with the consensus, I think. Good. Well, we're on socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Give us a follow, a like. Question, hypothetical. Do you think the sequel is going to be as successful, like number-wise, as this one? It's a, it's a big pull. It's a hard one. It's a hard one. It's, I, I would I would suggest probably. Mm. I, I just think it's just so different to releasing a sequel in the cinemas. And I know behaviours are trending in a completely different direction with the way we consume movies, but there's still just such a nice, and I, I love going to the movies, don't get me wrong, but there's such a nice appeal of having a brand new film that no one's ever seen coming into my living room so that I can watch on the weekend or watch on a Friday night. And uh, and I watch one of my favourite actors in something completely new. Like, it's it's such an easy conversion. And I think whether people go like, oh, murder mystery number one, oh, I wasn't that good. I don't need to, need to see the sequel. It's just not as big a commitment as, as it has to be. So I think it will do well. Yeah, I like your take because I, I think, yeah, if you've got Aniston and Sandler in it again, and I'm guessing you're probably going to try and cast some other um, higher grade celebrities in there in, in some supporting roles that, um, especially if you sort of tease the villain a bit and the villain, someone, you know, a Hemsworth or, you know, someone from anyone from the Marvel sort of universe um, that's got, you know, big bankable uh, dollars, then, yeah, I think it's going to be a success too. And yeah, and if not, you, you try and get Rob Schneider and Kevin James in there because uh, it, they, it felt weird they weren't. And David Spade as well. <laughs> David Spade. David Spade oh, yeah, they should all be in it at some point. I agree. Well, let's uh, let's have a look towards next week because we'll be back again 
with a coming of age drama from 2019 called Beats. It's directed by Chris Robinson and it stars Anthony Anderson and Khalil Everidge. So that's what we've got next week, a coming of age drama called Beats. I don't know anything about it. Only I remember the poster and that's about it. So yeah, okay. excited to give it a crack and, and see what it's actually about. Yeah, fresh blood there. Yeah, looking forward to that as well. Good. As usual, uh, it's been a good chat and I'm glad we got to do another Sandler movie. It's, it's, it's felt like a while because we had quite a bit in big chunks. That's true. Yeah, he was he was really heavy early, but um, we'll get more. We'll get more. Excellent. And I'll see you next week. You will. See you then, mate. <laughs>